inside her I am the better man When I look to leave her I always stagger back again Once I built an ivory tower So I could worship from above When I climbed down to be set free She took me in again There's a big In her charm, she just throws it back at me. Once I dug in her grave. Right, here we go. Episode 30 of the track in the house. Coming in hot MK. Friday, June 11th. Oh, goodness, my friend. It is almost summer. It's here. It's We've here. made it. It's, it's here. here. Yeah. How do we feel it. about that? I can't believe it. It almost seems surreal, right? I'm just, I'm it was trying, the long- I'm trying to process. Yeah, it was like the then. longest, shortest year. I don't know. It was just like a weird, weird year. I mean, I feel like it went fast, but I also feel like it was dragging. I don't know. It's just the most bizarre year ever, but it's down to the end now. Final day yeah, on Monday. It's, yes, final day is on Monday. And then we have, uh, we have well, final day of in-person classes. In-person, yeah. Monday. And then we have a couple of a uh, handful of fully remote days after that. But uh, I think we can get through that with no problem. Yeah. Uh, but oh, my goodness, it's just the packing and the getting the rooms ready for the move to the new wing have just been I, I, I have had mixed feelings for the past week and a half. I've the first time in 24 years I've had to break down everything off the walls and yeah it was a big down, move for you that's for take sure all i mean it's just it was there was a wave of emotions coming over me like i just i wasn't expecting it and every time somebody would come in it could have been a kid or faculty member custodians administrators somebody everyone who came in was like wow this uh this doesn't feel like your room oh great <laughs> <laughs> thanks like i mean it was a compliment for sure but like yeah the more i looked around at how empty it was i was like wow it really doesn't feel doesn't feel like it's been my room for so long it's yeah, just you've had stuff on those walls for 20 something years yeah we got, just, we got uh, to see how well our walls were cleaned we now, certainly did now there's a nice <laughs> outline of where everything was we see the original yes. paint color now on the walls yes, we do see the original paint color. <laughs> or in where they painted spots. or where they may have painted around they painted your around it yes that's yeah. true that's true i will admit that i was lazy when it came to taking things down at the end of every year only because i knew it was going back up yeah it was going back up and yeah and our our uh our summer crew is so good the the guys are so good about looking out for our stuff and they were always like yeah i'll leave it we'll work around it it's not a big deal so yeah you know shout shout out to the to the summer crew comes in and takes care of us stuff. they got a big job big job ahead of them this year is they're going to be moving all of our stuff over and getting everything set for us in september so it should be exciting for sure for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I will tell you that uh, I have officially declared war on the rabbit in my backyard. Okay. Okay. Who has been picking at my garden. I've been very, very good about taking your advice about all the different things I need to do for this garden. I got tomatoes I, already, by the way. All right. You don't have to rub it in. I do have. <laughs> No, I do have I do have things budding. Okay, I have not okay. I have not shared it on my Instagram yet because I'm not proud enough of it yet. Yeah. But once they start to come through, I did get a couple of strawberries, handful of strawberries. Good. Um, so that was good. But no, they, I you know, I, I noticed that about a month ago things were getting nibbled, plants were getting pulled, and so I fenced it off and I thought I had everything ready to go. And sure enough, last weekend. The dog's going nuts at the back door early in the morning, and I go out, and the little stinker son of a gun found his way in through one little area that I left open. I think they also dig, too, I think, too. You gotta I don't them. know. I All I know is that I knew he was trapped in there, so I went out. Obviously, I let him get out, but I saw he squeezed right through. It had to be about that, that big. It's like nothing, barely a space, so I had to seal that part off. So now, hopefully, knock on wood. It's coming. 
that rabbit's compromising all your work. It's compromising my work, bro. It's just, wow. and I have to tell you, the dog is addicted to the fish diarrhea. Every time I put it down, this guy is trying to dig out whatever. If you were a dog, you'd love the fish diarrhea I, too. I, I mean, just I can't understand it. He's trying. Gardens to... love it, plants love it, and dogs love it. I guess so. Apparently, Flies your love dog, it, I think, your dog loves naps, as I can see her in the back there. I know yeah, our, she's always in the our back. Uh, our superintendent, Doctor Burke, is a big fan of Rory the Sheep and Doodle. In fact, yeah. the last time she was in the building, she commented on how much she enjoyed watching Rory in the back of the last episode, even Rory. more so than. Then yeah, us and our crew. Yeah, woke her up. Right? He's sleeping back there. Oh, there she goes. Oh, now, now she's, she's, now she's, she's laboring. <laughs> no, no, now she's coming over. She's yeah. going to say hello. She had to get a yeah. pet. Oh, yeah. Good job. She's a good nice job, Rory. Yeah. Um, things are changing here in New York. Our protocols are opening up. I tell you, uh, it's like it's like normal now. I feel like I feel like I, I haven't. Besides for work, I feel like I never wear my mask anywhere. It's bizarre. Yeah. I'm I'm only comfortable outside right now. Yeah. I will constantly wear it whenever I'm in inside. A store. Yeah, I don't care if it's if it's optional or not. Yeah, um, I just don't feel like I'm at that. Personally, I'm not at that level yet. I'm just. Yeah. Eh, I'm ease like that. Back into it. Maybe maybe like you like ease your way back in. You wear your mask, but you slowly punch holes in it. Like every day, you punch <laughs> one hole. I could, I could it's very like, well. It's like quitting smoking or something. Yes. It's like one a day, every day. By the like the first week, you have seven holes in your mask, and then the second week, you're just breathing in regular air. And you or I'll up. or I'll graduate to a Hannibal Lecter with the bars yeah. in, the, in the middle. Uh, maybe I'll do something like that. I may be on to something that. that's for people to quit the masks or slowly <laughs> reveal their normal faces again. Like it's like going ease eating. their way back in because you know yeah, you know there's those people that like wear the masks and you you've never seen the bottom part of their face and then they take the mask off and you're like oh oh absolutely oh and I'm guaranteeing there are kids next year that I will not know who they oh are. yeah a hundred percent I see some of them like walking like to like the pizza place they don't have a mask on and I'm like oh wait is that my kid or is it not <laughs> yeah it's yeah it's it's really it's awkward it really yeah it is. Awkward. It is. So we'll we'll see how it goes. I mean, I I'm hoping that by September we're a hundred percent good to go. Me too. My fingers, my fingers are crossed. So Me too. We'll, we'll see how it goes. But yeah. uh, you know, yeah. Good things, good things, and yeah. good things. Speaking of good things, episode thirty, my friend, a milestone for us. Yeah, we great episode. To, yeah, wanted great to go guests. big. Yeah, we we felt like we uh, we wanted to really celebrate. Our thirtieth episode. We didn't think we were gonna get to three episodes, let alone thirty. Thirty. But uh, we went with a, a a threesome again. Another another trifecta of amazing people. We had uh, Jessica Gilbert from uh, um, Vancouver, from British mm-hmm. Columbia, and then we had uh, our buddy, uh, old friend uh, Alex Stewart, Alex joining Stewart. us again. Came back from season one, episode four, and then we pulled in David Popa from Finland. Yeah. Holy cow. All three of them, great. All know each other. I'm so talented. Yeah, all good friends. Um, all big environmentalists, and that's why we had them on together. Yeah, uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about how the environment influences them and informs their work, and and how active they all are in preserving the environment and working to help the environment, and how their work is environmentally friendly and how they incorporate it in. I thought that was a fantastic episode. And, and it, they were just so much fun to talk to. The three of them were just amazing. Yeah, they really, really were. Yeah. So uh, get ready, folks. It's episode 30. Strap in. Enjoy the ride because episode 30 of The Drop is on right now. My friend, I'm very, uh, very excited for this episode. We have not one, not two but three fantastic creative people with us today. We cannot wait to get to talk to all three of them. We've discussed some things with them earlier in the week and we are excited and ready to go. We have with us today, Jessa Gilbert, David Popa, and the returning champion from season (laughs) one, episode four, our old buddy, Alex Stewart. And they are with us today for a milestone episode. We're going to talk a little bit about the connection between environment and artwork. And all three of these artists are so 
amazing with using the environment, being inspired by the environment, advocating for the environment, and doing it through visual artwork. It's just all of their work is outstanding. MK and I have been following all three of them for a long time and are big fans of their work. They all happen to know each other through social media as well. I know Alex and Jess have actually worked on a couple of projects together in person, which is very cool we want to get to. Um, and we're going to talk about all that. Who knows how long this is going to go? I know talking to Alex earlier in the week is like, you realize it's going to be like a 15 hour episode, right? Because the three of us can just keep going on and on and on. But that's a good thing because uh, we love process. We love to talk passion. We love to talk about what it is that makes you do what you do. And having spoken to all three of you previously, uh, I think we're going to have no problem with that because the three of you really, really are not only so talented, but very articulate and well-spoken about what it is you do. And that's so important for us and our students too, is we, we try and make our students what we like to call triple threat artists, meaning that they not only produce work, but they know how to write about it and they know how to discuss it intelligently um, so that it really, really legitimizes what it is that they do. Um, especially in, in you know, this day and age when art can be considered frivolous and everyone tells them, oh, that's great, that's a nice hobby, but I don't know if you're going to make money off of it. And we have three very successful artists who are hustling all the time and have proven everything wrong in that regard by being three very, very successful artists. So I'm going to start off, ladies and gentlemen, with what we like to call our origin stories. And I know there's three of you, so I'm going to just pop this out. We're going to go ladies first. And I'm going to ask Jessa. Oh, uh, yeah, here she goes. Oh, no, you're going to pick on me first. Um, what I did find fascinating in the pre-checks that we had was that Jessa and David are both originally from New York. And not just upstate New York, but New York. Like, we're talking New Yorkers, man. They're just like us. So, Jessa, please, if you could briefly just give us a rundown of where you grew up out here on the East Coast and... What was your education like coming up through the New York school system? And when was art a prominent part of who you were and what you wanted to do? Oh, man. <laughs> no um, pressure. Yeah, like, oh, shoot. Those are three big questions. Um, yeah, so I grew up in Red Hook, New York. So I don't know if you know this, but there's two Red Hooks in New York. One's in Brooklyn. It's super hip, really cool not where I'm from. <laughs> not where you're from. <laughs> I'm from Red Hook in the Catskills. So it's about oh, two okay. hours from New York City. And, um, but it's funny, like growing up, it was cows and corn and very rural. And now it's become sort of a commuter city for the city, they, uh, a commuter town for the city. People are taking the train. It's a two hour train ride into Penn Station, which is psycho for a one way commute. But anyway, that's where I grew up. It's uh, very historic right along the Hudson River, really nice rolling hills. Um, my education in art, like I started drawing at a really young age. I grew up with three brothers in a split household and art was really my escape. Like I didn't know why I was drawn to it. I think it was my only way of sort of expressing and releasing what I was feeling. It was a way of communicating. It just, it felt free and it felt unattached to other things. Uh, and it slowly became, you know, as I moved through school, it became a way to really try to like harness in what I was trying to say, what I was feeling, you know, you're an angsty teen and making marks just kind of feels good. Like you don't have to have it so put together in a paragraph or in a written form. It can just be a collection of color or, you know, whatever it is you're doing. Um, but what's funny, I like always paired art with, like I was working or I was competing a lot in snowboarding at the time in high school, I started freestyle snowboarding and I was a three season athlete and I got really into music. Like for a while I actually put down the pen and I picked up guitar and flute and piano. And I was just like trying any way I could to express. And it, it just so happened that I came back to painting as my medium. I think that I think of artwork as, you know, you're trying to figure out how to say something and depending on what you're doing, the medium will be different. Like whether it's pen or graphite or acrylic and um, through time, yeah, painting in whatever medium it is became the way that I could express what I'm feeling, which eventually <laughs> fast forward to where I am now. I live in British Columbia. I live in the mountains right now in Revelstoke and, and it's awe inspiring. The scale here is grand. It makes you feel small and humble and there's wonder and curiosity. 
And for me, using paint and line and now big murals is a way to kind of articulate how that feels. So I've moved away from maybe using, well, I'd still use small scale and I use large scale. So there is a bit of both there, but it's playing with the tones of this location that I'm in, the feeling of adventure and sport and activity and try and have all of these elements come together as a way to just showcase and celebrate how striking it is here and how fleeting it is. You know, wilderness is, de is deteriorating over time. We're really, really lucky to have wild spaces in Canada. I'm super aware of that after coming from New York. Like you can't go into the woods without seeing a private property sign or being in like somebody's old rundown barbed wire fence or an old right. stone wall. Like that's, that's the landscape of upstate. Right. Um, but here it's just, you're lost real quick. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's legit. Yeah. 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 I don't that's know if that awesome. answered anything, but <laughs> no, I mean we just we we like to give our we like to give our viewers backgrounds on you know where you came from and, and your experiences. And eventually we want to talk about how they've shaped those things, like the, how those experiences have shaped your artwork and your lifestyle. And David is part of uh New York graffiti royalty. It's in his bloodlines. We learned that his dad. Uh, was one of the pioneers of the graffiti movement in the 70s. Uh, used to go by the uh, the moniker Conan. Um, and we thought that that was pretty cool. So David, if you want to just give us, uh, we know that you're originally from Queens, right? That's right, yeah. So how well, I was did, born, in, born in Brooklyn, but Born yeah. in Brooklyn, I see, I love that. Everyone's always like, no matter <laughs> where you grew up in New York, you were born somewhere cooler in New York. Yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly right. Exactly right. <laughs> it's all about street cred. I got it. It's all about the street cred. So born in Brooklyn. So growing up in Queens, how did that environment shape you? And having a dad who was artistic and a dad who was into more of like the street culture side of art, did that influence anything about what you were getting into growing up? Yeah, it's super interesting because yes, my dad so, you know, my dad was, you know, you could say he's an original graffiti writer back in the early 80s, but the reality is that's like, you know, he was 15 years old, right? He did that for two years. He did crazy stuff. However, there was a lot of conflict, um, internal conflict, and like, he got arrested, and there was a pivotal moment for him in which he, um, he got caught. The police were at his house. They tracked him down because he was they just followed Conan. They just followed tags of Conan. It was just like, they just knew he lived there. And he had this confrontation with the police and they came to his, his, his room and his, roof, his room was just littered with drawings and everything. And they saw he was really gifted. And, he, and my dad was, he was sort of like a big, tough guy. He, he, played, he played football. He was into bodybuilding, hence Conan the Barbarian. He was like really strong guy. I mean, he could like bench 300 when he was 16 years old. It was like ridiculous. But the, but at that moment, the police officers were there in sort of a very vulnerable state, and they challenged him, and they're like, you could never become a professional artist. You're always going to be doing, you know, you're always just going to be on the streets doing graffiti and stuff like that. Like, you're never going to be able to take it to the next level. Wow. And, um, and he took that as a challenge, and through a series of events, he actually ended up getting stabbed at 17, almost dying, had to go into overdose surgery, just crazy, crazy story. And ultimately, actually... It was the old masters, Michelangelo, um, sort of the Baroque time period. The, 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 when you, you know, enter the Metropolitan Museum of Art, whoever has been, and you, and you, and you enter that, that whole, there's a wing where you, I think you take a, you, you enter in, you go straight up the stairs and you just enter yeah. that wing. I mean, that was, that was like, to him, that the lights came on then, somehow that was, that changed things for him. So it was very interesting because when I was a kid, he tucked away all of the black books, all the graffiti stuff was hidden. Really? And all I was exposed to was the Met. And I mean, it was like, if it was figurative painting and it was, you know, from the, 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 the classic dudes, it was awesome. Everything right. else was and eh, not so great. But as a kid, you look at the graffiti stuff and the color and all that. And I was like, whoa, dad, like, tell me more about this. And it was all sort of um, difficult for him to talk to because it was all connected to a, the stabbing and right. sort of a prior life with violence, drugs, and all, all this, you know, kind of had a very negative connotation. So it was wild to be, I mean, in Queens, it's like, there's graffiti. I mean, it's every, right? It's everywhere. Yeah. I mean, it's New York City. 
and and my dad is like hiding his black books and all he wants to expose me to is like you know classical painting and quite frankly like I didn't hang out in Queens so much so that he like sent us all of us my two siblings to like a private school very small private school in like Park Avenue in Manhattan and so like he didn't want to expose me to sort of you know just you know almost street culture so it was crazy that like my story comes all the way full circle and actually comes back to it. So if I sort of just fast forward, I don't want this to take too long, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm exposed to, to, to all the figurative stuff and, and, you know, sort of studio practice and middle school. And then high school, I get to, I go to Sierra LaGuardia Arts High School, which was like, you know, sort of a rigorous portfolio review and everything to get to the school, but just like doing, you know, doing art my whole life, but it never really clicking um mostly because of the fact that I was into sports and I was just into being outdoors and that just somehow sitting down and drawing I just didn't get that wasn't enough of an outlet for me as, as a as a young teenager but I did all my life and then finally it, it didn't it, until college I just sort of stumbled into the idea of going to this legal wall and now taking all the skills and stuff that I had so one of my first pieces was actually painting a uh, section of the Sistine Chapel in my own version with God coming down to this artist, um, to these two artist guys on a boat anyways, but like painting like Michelangelo, but with spray paint. And that changed my life. That was like, it became kinetic. So for me, it was like, this is a wall, this is big. And some dude can come and paint over this the next day. So I've got like, you know, 13 hours of sunlight. How am I going to execute this? And um and that's that's really my story. And it's so funny because only at the, around that time, my dad, like, you know, he tucked away all the stuff because he stopped so abruptly because of this this whole you know situation with the police. Right. But he actually sort of returned to the scene around the same time that I started getting back into it. And only then did he realize that people considered him some sort of like kind of legend um, uh, in the right. scene. And so it's, it's just a kind of a wild story. But that's ultimately when the whole thing, um, yeah, when, when everything changed, I started doing murals. And then where I'm at now is I, I traveled, I was, I was doing, you know, I just wanted to get, get, you know, build my portfolio. So I traveled to Finland, met a girl here. She's now my wife. I have two kids. And I've been living here for almost six years. And the transformation, which has been a kind of a gradual transformation past six years to the urban scene to essentially using natural pigments and painting on uh, islets and islands here in in Finland and in, in, in the Nordics and that transformation it kind of happened gradually um but um but yeah sort of yeah I mean I don't know the if journey, that the journey has certainly been interesting for sure and then we have yeah. our good buddy Alex Stewart we know your backstory from episode four starting off in skateboarding culture up in Canada and being appreciative of the graffiti scene up there, whatever graffiti scene there was at the time. And then we know you got into working on automobiles and airbrushing and spray painting, and then moving into this incredible transformation of bringing the work outside into the environment. And uh, so Alex, just, you know, just review for our, our listeners who maybe have not seen episode four, just, you know, what was it that sparked you into doing what it is you do now? Uh, oh, probably around the same lines as like how David made his transition as well. And I was always brought up thinking like art was studio practice, really. Like there was no legitimacy to like graffiti or being outdoors and um, and then around the same time, so probably about three years ago, um, well, actually like three years ago yesterday, I did my first outdoor piece, um, with like, after figuring out how to make like biodegradable paints and the paper and, uh, like buttoning down that whole process. Uh, it was around that same time that I discovered like Hula and his work. And that was what inspired me to transition to being outdoors with my with everything that I do basically now um and it was around the same time that I realized just how bad the automotive painting industry is for um everything I mean they're transitioning <laughs> they're, but for they're, primarily they're, for health reasons right for health reasons. yeah for like health reasons there's obviously like a whole other backstory there with like 
the health things that I've been dealing with, but uh, um, it was the health reasons, the environmental reasons, like a lot of, a lot of shops are not, you know, on the up when it comes to taking care of the environment and making sure they're doing things right. The, the industry is slowly transitioning to a better place, but it's still not where I would like it. So I got out um, and then started focusing on everything else that I do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And slowly transitioning to like, I was like, you mentioned like working bigger, like murals and that limited time frame and generally like space. And uh, it's, I think it's the challenge and the scale that has me inspired right now. Right. Right. All three have been known to do large scale outdoor stuff and small scale studio work. Where do they each inform each other and, and what are the rewards and challenges of both? I'm going to throw it to Dave then first, because I see you all like, oh, God, who's going to go first? Dave, I'm going to throw it out to you first. <laughs> well, OK, so the studio practice for me at this point in time, um, you know, you're you can only and I tell this, I, I, I run a mural course, you, your, your ability you know on a large scale is always going to be you know um informed by how well you can tackle something in i mean inside inside the studio and so inside the studio is really where you should be um pushing your abilities uh in terms of just technical technical aspects and uh you shouldn't be basically trying new stuff on such a large scale i mean that that may seem obvious but actually to some uh, some artists who have tried to do something large scale they get pretty uh discouraged when they're just kind of winging it because there's just not generally that's not the way to to go about and I, I try to wing some murals early on I did realize that planning was was crucial so so for me um definitely that's where it lands right now it's also just like a very pragmatic thing when I moved here and I want to become a professional artist it was also like what were the opportunities that I was given and it was like to do I was doing murals and also to have shows and so it was um, sometimes begrudgingly, I was like, all right, put together a solo show and paint 40 works in like, you know, a month and a half. And, and, and you're literally churning out a painting a day in your studio. And that space does have to, I definitely have a firm belief that that space has to really inspire you. I, any studio space that I've, 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 you know, been in, I've tried to make it as, as inspirational as possible. Um, mainly because I found that when I started working outdoors, like anytime for me, outdoors it's, it's always going to be the most exciting to be outdoors because it's just like anything could happen. Anyone could come across. I mean, there's this, there's so much life. So that indoor space really has to be inspiring. At least for me, that was huge. But um, to be very honest, where, where I'm landing right now, it can be really hard for me to, to be indoors, especially if I want to use, if I, if I want to do a piece in spray paint, even though I don't do ton of work with spray paint still that's very hard to work on a large scale indoors just because of the fumes and it just doesn't feel right it just I don't, it just doesn't feel right so uh, I don't know if that answers the question but um but definitely for I have to always like think about you know individuals like starting out um like, like I think the most emphatic point I would make is that you, you you have to have more than anything the studio practice is sort of like doing the reps it's like doing it's doing the reps in the gym right or the sets and the reps where you're getting in shape the performance is outside right that's mm -hmm. the race that you run right that's the that's the big game that's the game that's how i see it so i think that's probably the best analogy right right interesting alex what would you you know because we know you have an extensive studio practice too um but you're also what i i, I noticed a lot about your work through your feed is that all of your ideas in the studio eventually seem to then gravitate towards the outside to the environment. So how does yeah. that work for you? I think it's the the same thing that David just said is like, for me, working in the studio is kind of practice. Um, and, well, practice and like time to recharge because it seems to be after mm -hmm. every large wall that I do, I'm dead for about a week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, especially like I, uh with my background as like a like a, com a commercial painter I kind of have that switch where um when I'm on site and working on a mural I don't it's not fun anymore 
<laughs> I kind of flip the switch and go into work mode and I'm like, okay, it's time to get the job done after I've done all my planning. Um, like that being said, it is still fun. I do really, really enjoy site work and I really enjoy painting murals, but it's not relaxing. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's more like time to get the job done because generally there's time constraints and there's like logistics with working with people and um, like organizing a site, especially on like public walls where you have to like organize with a city sometimes to like not have people parking down a road so you don't like paint their cars by accident. Um, a lot of uh, things, a lot of things that they don't teach you in yeah. school. Like all of those things. And that's uh, that's another reason why MK and I do this program is that these are just things that come up that you basically had to learn how to handle on the fly. Yeah. Yeah. And like it I, I, I remember um I mean my one of my first experiences with doing like a large scale, large scale mural was when I actually met Jessa and we worked on her piece in Squamish. Um and then at, shortly after that, maybe a couple months after that, I did my first large solo wall. And I think that um, Jessa probably knows better than I do. That was like two years ago, three years ago. I think it was three. I was thinking about that. Yeah. Today. It was three years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Jessa, jump in. <laughs> so with, with your background also during murals, but I've noticed a lot in, in from what, and you know, Social media is only so much what the artist wants to show people. But from what I see in your feed, I feel like your time spent outside is used to inform your studio work even more so. That you're like more of an adventurer who's bringing the, that, that whole environment that you're experiencing to the viewer once you get back into the studio. Is totally. that, yeah, is, yeah? Am I on the right track with that? I don't want to make assumptions. 100%. 100%. Yeah, like you know, kind of what David was saying, like when you're in school and you're an athletic person, you can't get that release through artwork. And what I was taught in school, which is often taught is that when you're an artist, you hang in galleries and you chain smoke cigarettes and you stay up late and you're like super artsy and you wear black and you're so smug and you're here. And then I was over here <laughs> snowboarding and I like to go to bed at nine and I don't smoke cigarettes. And so I didn't like it at all. So it's like trying to like invention. <laughs> I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's the art world. It's like black and white is king, figurative is king, have something to say. It's political. It's intense. It's mm -hmm. uh, it's highbrow. You don't understand. It's pretentious. It. Yes. It's yeah. exclusive. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I didn't feel like I fit in the art world, but I was inspired by art and communicating through making things. And I didn't feel like I fit in the outdoor world necessarily because I wanted to create things. So I'd, I'd always be over here competing in snowboarding and wanting to go out and like the thrill of the adventure. And I'm like a physically active person. I love to move my limbs. Like maybe it comes, I've been injured a lot. And so the ability to actually move up mountains, I'm like, damn, humans are incredible. This is great. I'm going to do this as long as I can, because when I get broken and old, I'll do artwork, but right. <laughs> it's just so cool that, like, you can't compartmentalize yourself. So I think by moving to BC and I was injured at the time and I wasn't able to go snowboarding. I had a full knee reconstruction and my surgeon told me like, you won't snowboard anymore. You'll just be sedentary. I was like, great. I'll just be an artist. And then I was so sad. I didn't want to make art. <laughs> yeah. So I like started walking and drawing what I would see. I started this like process I used maybe you've taught your students it's called the single line drawing and you get yeah. out of your own way it's like a warm-up exercise like what are you going to make with one single line in two minutes 30 seconds whatever it is it's like the process of it, removing yourself from wanting it to be this masterpiece actually allows you to play and I think through that process of playing it allowed me to actually look around and be like okay well how do I describe this environment how do I show how it feels to like snowboard down a mountain or run up a peak like how do I pare things down to its most essential and limited element, the one black line or whatever it is? Like, you're trying to say so much with so little. Like, mm. there's this, I think it's an Abe Lincoln quote, and it's like, I didn't have time to write you a short letter, so I wrote you a long one instead. It's like, when right. you have so few things, you have to be really intentional with what you're doing. And I think for me, it's like, I'm just trying to make as much work because I'm always thinking about how do I do it better? How do I say it differently? How do I really get at what I'm trying to do or say? And the more that I make, the less that I care if it's this masterpiece. 
It's more about the process of working that I'm able to actually get out of my own way to not care that it's in a gallery or not to just focus on, you know what, I love exploring and I love creating artwork. And whoa, it's crazy that these things co like combined and came together. And then it turned into murals. Like it didn't just become like, I walked up to a wall and I made something massive. It translated to that because I was already working so diligently, like they were saying in the studio and on my craft and thinking about what it is I wanted to do and say so that when I got to the wall, I already knew how the colors were gonna interact. The only thing that changed was the scale and the relation to the body. Instead mm -hmm. of things that are in your hand or on a wall, you're creating artistic environments. So for what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to evoke a feeling of humble, like mountains that are rising and being immersed in landscape. What better avenue than a big wall? You're physically surrounded by color and you're tr I'm trying to make people feel the vibrations that you get from spending time outside, the sun setting. That happens over time and we don't allow ourselves to sit there so often. We're quick, we're like, get to the top, blah, rapid fire your phone and you don't even look around. You're experiencing things through your technology. So I think artwork is a great way to make people either see it at a quick glance, like, oh, mountain, move on, or, oh, Sistine Chapel, move on. Or they get to sit there and they get to think about like, how they're experiencing it and what the colors around them make them feel like or or maybe they don't and that's the other thing like you can't make people like your work but I like making it and I like the process and that's enough and I think that if I connect with one other person what a what a win and if not it's the only story I know how to tell is how I experience things and perhaps other people can connect with that. I think that there's so much pressure we put on like young artists, like you need to know what to say and you need to know what to do and you need to know how it's going to look at the end. No, you just need to get to work. You just need to start yeah. playing and like experiment, like make your own tool, mm -hmm. make crappy art. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was my whole like university experience was you need to be producing your masterpiece and you need to know exactly what you're saying. Um, and yeah. that's not, really how art works no. um no. like no one ever no. knows what they're saying uh like entirely you're that's kind of just a constant work in prog progress and um something that jessa said that really kind of hit with my work as well is people don't slow down and appreciate like where they are and that's a real a huge point of why i do what i do especially like with my outdoor work is to create that like surreal space where if someone were to stumble upon, upon one of my portraits, um, they're immediately forced to like take a moment and soak in the environment. There's no moving past it quickly. There's no, mm. um, like there's, it just, it, it forces people to stop and breathe for a second and just appreciate where they are rather than just moving past something super quickly and right. taking a photo and right. like just getting on with their life basically. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's such an important message that you that, you know, particularly just that you were saying about the fact that it, it, it underlies the philosophy that MK and I have in our classrooms, which is, it's all about the journey, don't worry about the destination, you'll get to the destination, but enjoy the journey first, like we you know when you deal with high schoolers who are so grade conscious. How many points am I going to get if I don't do it like this? How many points am I going to lose if I don't do it like this? Like, we have to keep telling them to take a breath, step back, learn the process first. The techniques are what's going to get you to wherever you, you know, you come in with so many of these preconceived notions of it has to look realistic. It has to look photographic. It has to look exact. It has to look exactly like this, like my photo reference. If my photo reference is crappy, then it's, I'm not going to get a good piece out of this. Like we have to constantly pull them back from that philosophy and emphasize that you're, number one, you're young. You're going to learn a whole lot more later on in life. You don't have to walk out of here knowing how to do everything and be Michelangelo. Like it's not, that's not gonna happen. That's not realistic. I mean, like I know David, you went to a very competitive arts high school. Was that ingrained in you? And how did you break out of that? Or did you break out of that? Well, high school, I mean, there's no comparison to compare my high school like to my dad. That's just like, I mean, my dad was on some other level. I mean, at six years old, he was making me draw the patella. He was making me draw bones. So. It was just like, 
he didn't push it too hard, thankfully, because I would have really liked. I mean, there was just no jump to like. There was no Mickey Mouse. There was the clavicle. <laughs> it was like <laughs> it was like anatomical studies. I was just like, and so, and that's what was sort of ingrained in me. So, but then going into into high school, actually, I mean, it was it was a solid arts education in the sense that there was a lot of freedom. However, I think there was actually too much freedom in the sense that there, you know, there were so many of my colleagues that from freshman year to senior year there was no real improvement. And I was only able to make improvement, not because I, it was up to me, it was because my dad just kind of was like, all right, Dave, after you do all your sports stuff, I'm forcing you to come to the studio and I'm going to, you're going to do a master copy. That's where it's kind of, that's where it really was able to move forward. And so unfortunately, see, this is where it's a very, very fine line. Yeah, I was developing skills because my dad was kind of pushing me in that area and you saw I was gifted. However, I was not thinking of becoming an artist because that's what I saw art was. And then any sort of freedom that I got within school, it was, it was very much the same sort of mindset. It's like, how, yeah, how do I get the points to get the passing grade? How do I, you know, um, but there were just a few pockets of time, of course, because I was always, you know, for freshman to senior year, always doing some sort of studio practice. There was a few pockets of time where the best possible thing was that a teacher would see like a light switch go on about a concept that I wanted to do and, you know, and let me do it and kind of, and that was when, and even there was one teacher I remember, I mean, it was like a three, uh, we were in, in there three, four, I mean, it was four or five months taking, t- taking the course and you're supposed to do five, six paintings in that time. And I convinced him that I was going to just paint this one painting. It was this like crazy apocalyptic thing. And, um, and he begrudgingly was like, okay, fine, I'll let you do it where other students have to, 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 to move on. But it was things like that. And so I like continued that painting and I actually ended up selling that painting to some guy like at the school, at the LaGuardia show, like at, you know, when I was 16 years old. And that was, it was a few moments like that where it was like when teachers were just like, they see there's a fire there and they don't squelch it. And they're not, right. you know, they're like, well, the curriculum says this. And so ultimately it was like actually very hard even in college it was just like when I started going to the wall and painting like teachers couldn't even see that like I would like skip critiques to go to the wall to do this big project that I had to finish on the wall my own personal project and they couldn't see past that and so it's unfortunate um but uh, I, I just think a couple of key moments a couple of teachers within high school and but mainly my dad that kind of at least technically he kept me, you know, he kept me doing the reps so that when I did come to the realization of I actually really love this, then all of a sudden it was like, it just came, right. it just came blasting out. So, right, right. What I, I find so fascinating in all three of your stories is that regardless of what you were exposed to and what kind of art was getting your attention at the time, you all eventually at some point gravitated towards this notion of something with the outdoors, being outdoors or representing the outdoors. For for each of you, where does the natural environment inform your work? Where was that point of inflection within your own practice where you think you felt, I gotta represent this or I have to go out and put it here? Or I have to find a location and do this. Jess, I'm going to throw it out to you first. <laughs> oh, it's funny. I like, I was laughing because I can remember. I used to be a figurative painter. I didn't want to be a landscape painter. I thought that the world didn't need another Bob Ross. Like, I didn't really think landscape books were cool to paint. Like, I was like, I'm going to be a figurative. I focus on dancers and I was interested in the body. I think body mechanics are really cool. And the thing that the thread that's the same is I want to show the passing of time in a medium that never changes. So acrylic paint is static. It's never going to move, but how do you make it feel like it's moving? So I started with that with figures. And I remember I got to BC and I was sad. I, I wasn't able to run or anything. So I was like, I don't want to paint figures in motion. I can barely walk. <laughs> it's so, so sad. Um, and I was living in Vancouver and you look over at the North shore and it's cut blocks everywhere. And I was just like, this is crazy. Like how, and then there, it's like this beautiful, huge mountainscape that I'd never really seen at that scale. And then there's these like angular swaths just taken out. And I was like, that's 
messed up. <laughs> um, and so I was thinking like, oh, like just thinking on abstract forms and over time and yeah, always looking at the landscape. I think where, where things kind of clicked for me, I had already been, you know, hiking around a bit and getting more active as I started to get my health back. And I was on a split board tour, even though I was told never split board again. I was like, forget you, Dr. Slaughterbeck. I'm going to do what I want. (laughs) 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 And um, I was talking with, so in split boarding, you have to set a skin track up and you like make it into sort of angular forms and you weave your way up the mountain. And then as you come down, you sort of weave your line down. And I was asking him how, how do you build a skin track on a mountain? And he was pointing to the ridge behind me. He's like, you follow the ridges and you work with the landscape. And I started to think about, oh, isn't it interesting that we're actually always making our own lines in the landscape, like whether it's cut blocks or these beautiful lines up with our skin track and our snowboard line down that will eventually disappear. It's so fleeting, like snow changes daily. Um, wouldn't it be cool to investigate that, this sort of like infinity line? Like, and then how do you incorporate the landscape in that? And I'm probably gonna fail because it's a single line. What can you do with that? So it just <laughs> became this playful thing. And the more I did it, the more I was like, there's something here. There's something about like interconnectedness to the landscape. Like there's a real spirit in the First Nation community here well, in Squamish and within BC. And they talk about like our impact on the land and how when it rains down and it moves through the landscape and the forest and then it gets evaporated up, it's this sort of like cyclical period. It is a single line, it is all connected. And when we th- take things in parts, we, we miss the point. Like it's not just about people, it's not just about trees, it's not just about clouds, it's, it's all connected. But that's a really heady thing to say in like a cute little <laughs> drawing. <laughs> <laughs> So, Talk about like, deep and pretentious. Jeez, that's... I, know, um, I go down such wormholes, and so it's like you know what? It doesn't actually have to be this like big foreboding. Like, do better. Stop cutting down trees. The logging industry. Like, I feel all those things, but I feel like you're gonna in, like, you're gonna have a better opportunity to inspire change if you show them what is worth protecting. If you show mm-hmm. them that colors are vibrant outdoors and the scale is massive and you are small and we are part of this whole process and and we can play and I'm sure there's a background in like I worked in product development in the outdoor industry and I was surrounded by all these like skittle pop colors and so like my work is is bright because that's the world I know I know Gore-Tex and and like, <laughs> <laughs> like they come from freestyle snowboarding so it's all like that is my sort of I guess unique play to it but yeah how does it inform the landscape it was I got out of my own way. I just realized that like, I love to play and I love these landscapes and they make me feel human and part of something bigger than myself. And isn't that worth celebrating? And the work just started to flow from there. I suddenly wasn't forcing myself to make like political work and to make figurative Mm -hmm. work. Like that didn't feel like me anymore. And then I started doing landscapes. I'm like, fuck, I'm Bob Ross. (laughs) 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 Ah. But that's kind of what we were talking about. Like when you go into the studio, you're like, I'm going to be a very astute figurative painter and I'm going to paint photorealist and I'm going to do all this. No, you're mm. not. Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Maybe you no, want it's... a cartoonist or a muralist or whatever. Right. Like, right. Play. Mm. <laughs> right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fanboy out just a little bit here. And I'm going to say, Justin, that what I love so much about your approach to this, to the whole landscape genre is exactly what you said. It's not stuffy it's not the hudson river valley school it's so contemporary and Mm. so cutting edge and so unique and it does have for lack of a better term a new york street vibe to the line work and it's very (laughs) graffiti-esque in terms of the the illustrative parts of what you're doing with the work was that by design or did that kind of just organically happen for you it's, I mean, all of it happened through process. I think that process will lead to your product or to your outcome. What I really, I was like always kind of like either I'm painting or I'm drawing, these things don't mix. But then I, I discovered acrylic pens. I was like, ooh, I can do both. And it's like really fun to play with the line. Like we, it reminds us that we're human. Like I love when people have these like photorealistic things and then they add like a line to it. it you can't remove the artist from the creation. I think there's like a Rauschenberg like quote like that. It's just, we are always present. If we're making things, we are there. You can't, the artist is still present. It's always made by a hand. And I think that the line work for me, at least, it, it, it reminds me that 
it's still a thing that I made. It's still a gesture. It's still play. It's, it's loose. It's light. It kind of, yeah, it, it sort of separates it from it having to be so rigid. Like I think for my, when I was in the studio and only working in the studio, I had a tendency to really overwork things. I just paint and paint and paint and it would get so rigid and bad. And with keeping it quick, like the single line stuff where it's, you only have one shot and you have to get out of your own way and work kind of in the subconscious, like trying to bring the line work back into the large scale murals and play a bit more is where it, it stops being so stuffy and it stops being yeah. so overworked and like, yeah, just, it's hard to and know what to up, <laughs> It ends up becoming, for lack of a better term, it becomes relatable to everyone because not everybody is going to respond to like what you say, a stuffy landscape painting and be like, yeah, that's great. And feel completely engrossed in finding out more about it and going up and looking at it. I know for myself personally, like, like David, you talked about going to the Met. The beauty of where Mike and I live is the Met is 40 minutes from where we are. So we go whenever we can. And I will purposely bypass every landscape room because to me, it all looks exactly the same. And you just move on and you move on and you move on. But when you come across mm -hmm. something where you're pushing the envelope on an entire genre, which is what I feel that you're doing with your landscape work, it's like, it makes me stop and say, wait a minute, that's different. I've never seen that done that way before and i think that was the pull into it now with with alex i know with with your you are environmentally conscientious about everything so i know the environment is in your subconscious constantly from what you use to where you put it to what you're putting it on so walk us through a little bit about your philosophy with working directly with the environment and the products that you use i mean i think uh for me, it's more like probably the same with David is it's, it's a challenge to work like in and with the environment. Um, and it, I, and we talked about this a little bit uh, a week ago is like, you never really know what's going to happen outside. Um, I've had so many pieces just fail because a storm blew through halfway through my working on it. And um there's nothing you can do to avoid that. And you just have to accept that ha that happens. And so it's kind of along the same uh, lines as with Jessa. It's like, there's a there's a, a loss of control when you start working in the environment and you just kind of have to accept that and kind of like work with that. Um, and then as far as like the products that I use, uh, most of it I make myself just because I don't trust companies to make things that are you know actually environmentally friendly and right. will biodegrade and it's kind of like a product of my own design where i i've gone through over the past three years like hundreds of versions of the paint that i use uh and it all comes down to like using you know natural pigments and flour and water and sugar basically is all that it is um and then like rice paper and yeah. that's kind of the formula that I figured out to like have something go up once it's dry. And I, I've got, I need to figure out the best way to do it, but I want to time lapse the full uh, degradation of one of my pieces uh, to get like an exact time frame on it. Yeah. But that's something that <laughs> requires a, like a, a, a lot of work because I'm not quite sure on the best way to set that up or figure it out. Um, right. But I think that would be something interesting to explore. Uh, but it's a learning process. I think, I think yeah. that's what, what MK and I admire. We've talked about, we've been talking all week about how excited we are about to get to talk to all three of you at once. But I think what we find exciting about all three of you is that you're constantly evolving and testing and experimenting and trying new things and now mm. but, which leads me to ask david in particular like we know your work you work on a massive scale when we first saw mike and i saw your work i think we were mike i think we were we were at work on an off period a shared off period and we were looking through instagram and i said dude check out this like we were like checking out the where you set up the um the um uh you know, the, the coordinates and you have to find where it is on, and Mike, Mike's on Google earth on a, on a desktop <laughs> computer and I'm on the Instagram feed. I'm like, and I'm punching in numbers. I'm like, look at this one. No, let's see if we can find this one. And he's going on and he's like, and then we look at it like, 
oh my God, that's insane. How did that whole idea of physically using the landscape itself as your canvas, where did that genesis start for you? All right, so initially it was, um, I realized a habit of mine that I, I, I was, you know, you know, we look for inspiration all the time, right? Whether it's Instagram, Pinterest, the, you know, you're at a library. And I realized I was just gravitating towards nature photographers. And I was just like, like I'm, I don't even care about other artists and they're whatever they're, I mean, I'm just like, they, like nature photographers, adventure photographers, like I'm hooked on it. And I'm like, and this is like two, three years in, you know, and I'm doing the mural thing. I'm a professional, you know, visual artist. And I'm like, something's up here. So, so in a quick, quick background, I was almost every weekend, my dad would take us to, um, to Long Island, and we would we would just be out in the nature for almost every weekend. You take it would like almost like religiously go there, and that always there was always a connection to even though because I was even though I'm from New York City, there was always a desire to be in nature. So that was a key thing. So now fast forward, now all I see myself is looking at nature. And so then the idea was like, how like see this landscape? I was looking at the landscape. I was like, how do I put art here? That was that was the basis of it. And that, and and the first thing that I attempted to do. Which was which was really cool, and I still do a couple of these installations. Um, was using cellophane wrap and tie it between two trees, and then using spray paint and um, and basically doing portraits in the forest. And long story short, that actually went really that actually went really well, and I was able to do kind of a, a decent body of work with that. And but I quickly found there was a couple of aspects. One was the limitations that I like, I just couldn't push this, like how big can you, can you get? And so I actually had the opportunity. I paired up with a creative agency. We did a whole campaign for this one company here in Finland. And I literally got on like a mechanical lift that could like go over all this crazy, you know, uh, all the roots and everything within a forest. And I literally did a, like huge, huge pieces. Um, that's a whole nother story that actually was a half failed project. But I literally try to, like, I literally push that like to the extent that it could have gone um, where you're doing things, you know, you know, I mean, I must have been eight, 18, you know, 18 to 30 feet up into the air. And it was like, I would need a lift. It, it, all of a sudden I realized the limitations. And, and I, then we took it, I, I, I told my wife, like, let's just go, I want to I drive up to Norway. And, and my initial idea was like, how do I repel off of cliff faces and use like, like just washable chalk paint or something? And, 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 and ultimately and I try that and it just like, it failed. I mean, I did like a small piece. It just ultimately failed. And then one day it just clicked. It was like, well, duh, like just like stop thinking this way, get a drone and photograph it down. Like, and, and it took so many months because it was also so hard to find like, to figure out like I was talking about like what kind of materials do I end up using and I was experimenting with so much stuff and ultimately it was like really simple essentially I'm using like charcoal um charcoal pigment or this iron oxide it's like a mineral along with white titanium dioxide and I'm just like mixing it's just like raw you know pigment that you could if you had the raw mineral you could break down in my case I don't have that I've access like the charcoal I could do that by myself but not the white but, um, and, and then in terms of invention, then that was a whole nother path where I was like, had to basically rig up and change kind of a little bit of mechanics and the filter, like create a filter on garden sprayers. And then it actually was just extremely natural. I just took what I knew about large scale painting, large scale murals in the urban context. And, um, and the way I technically paint is very specific to me. I like use a squinting technique where I close one eye and I blur the whole image and so I'm actually very used to not having to step back to my work and I do portion by portion. So I was so used to painting on a very large scale, so close in the urban context that I figured, well, standing, standing on the ground and that, that distance is good enough for me to accomplish what I need to do. And so, um, but like so much doubt through that whole process and so much experimentation and, um, but it was just a real adventure. And I feel like I'm at least only just beginning this to be honest still, but uh, yeah. That, that's awesome. I mean, what, it, what I find so ironic, David, with your pieces in particular, is the fact that you had a dad who hid this, 
for you know, I mean, hot, you know, kept you away from this culture, this street <laughs> culture, and eventually, essentially, what you're doing is that you're going out and you're making your mark on areas without permission. And we talked about this mm. on the pre-check, how, you know, for, for most of the time, we all seem to be asking for forgiveness and then permission. Like that's just the philosophy. It's like, I see a spot, I'm gonna put my mark on that. I'm doing it in an eco-friendly, ethical way and I'm gonna do it anyway. And this is how I'm gonna get it out there. And I think the, what stuck with me from our pre-check last week with, with David and Alex was David, the story you told about the Coast Guard and how they, they first, so, and, and, I mean, if you want to talk about that a little bit, but how do you walk that fine line between, you know, you have unfiltered access to areas that are basically untouched. How do you walk the line between, should I be doing this here? What's going to happen if somebody sees me doing it? Where is the, you know, that the inner struggle with that? Or do you have that? Mm. Just like, ah, screw it. I'm just going to. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The huge inner struggle. And then, but then ultimately, like the very first piece I did, I like, I, I, I found a portion of a, of a, of a rock. See, this is also my, my, my thought process is like, I'm painting on the ground. Okay. Every, yeah, sure. Everything's eco friendly. No one can even see this. No one can even, if you, I'm using similar tones that exists on the rock. And so my rationale was like, I didn't, yeah, of course I saw some like onlookers, people were looking and then they, they asked me what I was doing. Most people thought I was some sort of a uh, scientist. They thought I was running tests. I mean, that's what it looked like because I had this weird sprayers and they thought I was just, and I had this whole like rig with my GoPro chest mount and my phone attached to my chest. And I'm like, it just, I look like some scientist. I don't know. And so it, 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 but essentially it was just taking kind of a leap of faith and then I guess a bit of luck essentially after I painted that piece you know I posted online but then like then the media like then the media like loved it and then they and then I was at, you know on television and so but but I never like that was never like on the horizon for me I was just like it was an experiment I tried to do a huge piece I was a portion of my wife um, but what was kind of weird and crazy about it was that, you know, like technically, so that portion of rock was owned by the city of Helsinki, but like a I, I big factor of this, 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 the rock that I chose was completely littered by seagull and bird poop, like completely, <laughs> this was their favorite spot. And so I was like, no one wants to be here. Everyone's avoiding this. No one would want to walk on this. But, you know, it ended up being absolutely gorgeous. After I painted it, the birds came back and just did their thing. But <laughs> so many people thought it was intentional because it looked like these abstract white streaks that were dripping off the rock. They thought I was throwing paint. And they were like, I love the way you threw the paint at the end there. And I was like, That's no. the birds. <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> but I sort of continued like that a couple of pieces later on until the story you're mentioning, which just happened a couple of weeks ago, doing one of my largest pieces today. And, 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 and I get a call from the Coast Guard and I don't even know how they, I guess they assumed it was me and I'm the only guy in Finland that paints on rocks, I guess. And, and they were like, they were very, very nice. They were basically like, yeah, we love your work, but like technically you should have permission from the city to call this person. And I was freaked out. I was like, the Coast Guard's calling. <laughs> like, and I'm like, this is like, I have to take a paddle board and really like, this is only fishermen and people are on their sailboats. Like, I'm real. I'm, I'm at least, I'm almost, I'm at least, uh, I mean, half a mile away from land. I mean, like no one. Yeah. So it like kind of freaked me out. And, but it was great. I called the, the, the number and, you know, she was basically like, you know, in very basic, very basic English. She was like, yes, you email me that you want to paint here and I will email you back saying this is okay. And I was like, Wait, so like, what do I have to sign? Like, like, like what, what geologist do I have to like confirm with that the eco, like I'm using all eco-friendly stuff. And, and, and that was like it. And then I just continued the project. I haven't released it yet. It's going to be releasing hopefully in a week. But um, uh, uh, sometimes you have to sort of, I guess like, you know, could have sort of consider one's conscience. I was like, there's nothing I'm doing wrong here. No one can see this. And 
the problem starts to occur and then sort of the naysayers come out when you start getting attention. See, like once you get attention, once you're in the media, then all of a sudden everyone comes out and is claiming you're destroying something and it's like right. it's right. a bunch of hoopla. Yeah. But um Alex, I see you nodding. Have you run into things like that too with, with your site yeah, specific stuff? A, a a little bit. Probably not as much as David. I mean, yours are a little well, a lot more grandiose than how the, the scale that I work. Um, like I think the largest piece that I've done on a tree is about like four by eight feet. And that was the largest one I've done. Um, but it's the same thing. You get people like either people, it's there's there's two ways. Either people are really excited about what you're doing and they like appreciate it, or they absolutely despise it. Yeah. Um, especially in the outside world. Uh, but I I find I found even with people that um that don't appreciate it if you can take a moment to have a conversation with them and explain to them like no like everything that I'm doing is like not harmful um they'll unless they're excessively stubborn see where you're coming from and appreciate it in the end if you can like sit back and have a conversation with them but that's Mm. the it's the getting someone who's willing to have that conversation is the hard part I find. Right. I think that that's such an important thing for our students to hear though, Alex, is that not just for you, but for the other two artists too, is that your, your art is designed to spark conversations Mm -hmm. and important conversations, not debates necessarily. And we know how the world has been in the past, God knows how long now, four years or five years now, where everybody is quote unquote tribal and everyone's got their side and everybody's dug in and they don't want to hear this side. They don't want to hear that side. I think what's beautiful about the three of you with your work is that it opens up a very benign conversation. It's important, but it doesn't have to be divisive. Mm -hmm. I don't think that you could necessarily argue on the side of being anti-environment. Like, how do you take that predicament, you know, how do you take that role in the predicament that we're in with the earth the way it is, listen to you explain it eloquently and articulate the intelligent side of what you're doing and how it doesn't damage anything and still be like, nah, I don't get it. Nah, that's terrible. Like, I just, I don't see that happening. I think that what's so great for our students to see in the three of you is that you're willing to put not only your work out there, but you're willing to stand behind it and discuss it and let it open up a larger conversation. Is that kind of where the three of you see yourselves as artists? Did you set out to be communicators and advocates or did that just kind of happen jessa what, let's jump to you with that one um i i'd love to think that i came out thinking i'm going to say something stoic and no it, it just it happened over time like i think that like i was saying i thought that art had to exist in a vacuum over in one silo and then my environmental side and playing in the outdoors like it it's selfish play like i i like to go just explore um but it was it was just through kind of working with if we're going to make anything i believe that we should make intentional things whether it's beautiful or you know whatever it looks like is different but like make it with some intention so when i approach artwork it's like what's the point (laughs) the point for me in one way is to release what i'm trying to say or feel or do and in the other way it's like well if i'm actually going to put it out there what again what's the point like what am I trying to do with it and I think just through the process of like okay I keep coming back to these landscapes I keep coming back to like for a while I was just I was obsessed with alpine I had never seen alpine in New York like everything's covered in trees here it's like you actually get into exposed rock features like okay what do I want to say and do with it and it just became kind of an exploration of like isn't this crazy what we're able to look at? <laughs> like, I'm still from I still get that every time I go out. It's like, I'm trying to, it started with like, I'm trying to show my family what it feels like to be out here. And then it just became like, okay, well, if I think it's so Im- important to have these places to go play in, like, why not have a, a stand on it? Because I do believe in that. I do believe we should put, protect these places. And I do believe it's special. And I do believe everyone should have access to it. 
And artwork mm -hmm. can maybe be a way of communicating it because maybe people don't want to read a book or listen to a podcast or be lectured. Like maybe people just will have an experience be like seeing color or with seeing other people play. Like, I think there's so many different ways we can communicate with each other and not all of us are an English speaker. Maybe people will have an experience with my paintings. Like we have a lot of people that are from Hong Kong, for instance, who have a different culture. And maybe there's a connection there through the color red that's used in the Alpenglow, which is exploring places of, or feelings of just change and grand landscape. I don't know. Like, yeah. I don't think it has to necessarily be like so crisp and articulate, but if people are asking you why you're doing what you are doing, you should have a, a response. Like what Alex and David are doing, like they're exploring places in landscape. And, and I, what I love about their work is that they are literally merging human elements and the like landscape. And so you can't not think about how we're connected to land because there's literal faces on the land. <laughs> yeah. I like think that. some people maybe need that literal smack on the head. Like mine are still abstract and mine are still playful and like line work. They're not necessarily people. Maybe someone will have a different experience through theirs and start to consider how they are impacted by an impacting landscape. Like it doesn't have yeah. to be direct. Always. Right, right. I think I it's, it's <laughs> it, there's, so, the, there's so many good points you make with that, Jessa. Like we have kids who do want to become active in certain issues and they want to know how they can tie their talents into helping that cause. Like we have kids who, you know, don't have, you know, they can't just uh, start a, a foundation or they can't do a nonprofit, but they can maybe do a painting that raises money for something they believe in and then, you know, use the proceeds for that. So I think it's important for them to hear that it's okay to want to be an activist and a visual artist at the same time and not have to necessarily be controversial. Like you can do it and just be yourself. You don't have to stand at, you know, on the mountaintop, literally or figuratively and scream that everybody else sucks and they don't understand and that it's wrong what they're doing and everybody come over to your side. And, you know, it doesn't have to be like that, but there is a way of connecting what you're passionate about with, your practice and, and with, you know, the, the way you do what you want to do and, and feel good about yourself doing it too. So um, what I want to get to with the three of you next is, is because you have such different approaches to artwork, our kids are going to be like, well, how the hell do they make any money, Mr. Senna? Like, how are they like, how are they making a career out of doing this? Like this guy paints on rocks. It, it washes away. How's anybody buying that? Because they're so used to make, <laughs> making a, making a piece, selling that piece, you know, mm. framing it, sending it out and selling it. So what role does the gallery system, social media websites, like the fact that we have the ability now to do everything on our own and design it and put it out there. How does that happen for each of you? Alex, I'll throw it out to you first. Like, how are you sustaining making work and making money from what it is you're doing? Um, well, I, I, I think it all starts with if you're doing it from a place that's genuine to you. Because like, I, if, even if I wasn't making money off this, I'd still be doing it and I'd still probably be doing it more than anything else. Um, and for, with that said, it's, it's more of a, I think we talked about this a little bit in the pre-check where um, for me, it's stubbornness and the fact that I'm a bit of a contrarian where like, I have been told so many times that like, especially like, and even by like university professors, like you're not going to make money doing this. So for me, it's like, well, yes, I am. Uh, <laughs> so a lot, I mean, and a lot of it, like, I don't think I've shown in an a, a proper gallery in like three years because I, there's no for what I do in particular there's no real space for that I don't think so a lot of what I do is through you know like Instagram my website like it's all online now like everything is um, and then with that it's also you know um, on the other side of things I do like I, I, I bring human elements into nature with my portraits and then I bring natural elements into the city with my mural work. So um, mm. all of my mural work is, you know, vibrant and colorful and generally involves like flowers or other natural things that you don't get a lot of in the city. Um, 
So for me, it's just bouncing between those two different um, but connected trains of thought where I want to, I don't know, I, yeah, I, I, I don't, <laughs> I, it's just kind of worked out really for me because yeah. it's the same thing where I think if you are genuine about what you do and enjoy what you're doing, other people will see that and support you. Right, um, right. And I've been fortunate enough where at least there's a little bit of an overlap in what I do and how right. people want to see the world, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Now, David, you're even more site specific. Like you're 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 going to impossible to get to places. Like literally, you're saying you're paddleboarding <laughs> half a mile out into the middle of nowhere where only you know shitting seagulls and fishermen are going to see your stuff. <laughs> we know we know that they're not buying it. So, what are you doing to create this? career as an artist who does what you do what tactics are you taking because we discussed in the pre-check they're not teaching you any of this in school like there's no business acumen class for painting on rocks in the middle of finland so what are you doing to get that work (laughs) out there i can obviously answer that question however there's such a there's such a journey it was such a seemingly long journey to get from that point where, so the answer to that question is, is that I take, uh, after I finish the piece, I basically take multiple images in which I then stitch them all together within Photoshop. And um, ultimately the final work is, is the final photograph in which I then do a limited edition print release. Sometimes it lasts only 48 hours, um, depending on the piece. Sometimes I still have some available. And, um, and it could only be collected at that time. And in my case, I thought that worked really, really beautifully because of the fact that the work is ephemeral and that this is sort of a snippet of this is the, you know, and, and so much so that, you know, like I'm, I'm usually battling against the rain. So once the rain comes, like it is, you know, the, the bulk of all the pigment is gone. Some of it absorbs into the rock so you can still see it from above. But after, definitely after a couple of months, it's completely gone. But that actually works beautifully in my favor in regards to print releases because the original no longer exists. Literally, the only, the, 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 the final work in, is, is the photograph. And so that played in beautifully. I've, however, the, the sort of journey to get there, to even have the guts to do it, because this is a real talk. We were, my, so, you know, a lot of the times, this has been my experience, moved to Finland, trying to get my stuff in galleries. It's been okay. Sometimes, you know, sometimes you do okay. The best success that I've had when I was to actually start doing murals, that was the, um, for multiple reasons, um, big reason is because, you know, if you get one large gig, um, you can get anywhere from five, 10, 15, 20, 20,000 on, on a really serious project, which then changes everything. And in contrast to selling stuff for, couple you know a couple hundred so that was the one big thing that i did you know was doing large-scale murals and i i would i would literally tell any every artist to sort of pick up um and and try to do murals because it's because a company comes to you and be like i love your work can you put it up in our and and and, and companies will have monies and and and, and generally if it enhances their brain and their image and exciting you know and it's it's uh, serving their sometimes their goal and their vision and they like your work um there, there's money to be had there but but uh, essentially, you know, it, it, so this is basically what happened is I painted my very first piece on, on, on the rock, took my photos, and I just like for fun, I was just like, oh, what if I took multiple photos, maybe I'll stitch it together in a, like a high resolution image. And, and the reality was at that time, you know, usually what will happen is it'll be a very long dry season where you just don't have gigs, you just don't have projects, and you're just like living, you know, from, from the, you know, four months prior when you had a bunch of work. And so uh, our family, so my family, so at the time is my, 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 my wife and I, and um, she was uh, pregnant or, or no, I had a, well, no, she was pregnant. So anyways, we were in a, not a good financial situation. And I basically, you know, so this is where the, the guts part where I like had a, a, a decent follow on Instagram, Facebook, but what on earth does that even mean? Like people are liking your photos. And I, I told my wife, I was like, I'm going to do a limited edition print release. There's one of my favorite artists, a guy named Jeremy Geds. He's an amazing painter. He does mm-hmm. limited edition print releases. Um, he does these cosmonauts. I mean, stuff is crazy. And he sells like a thousand prints. And I'm like, 
could I sell 10 prints? <laughs> like, could I just like get a couple of the, like, you know, and, and I was so nervous and I was, I was like, this will, and, and cause I've wanted to do that. And I was like, if this doesn't work, if only like three, four people buy my print, like I'm going to be really disheartened, you know, four print. I mean, that'd still be solid if it's a hundred bucks, maybe I make 400 bucks, but I, I'd still feel pretty disheartened. And, um, but to take that leap of faith and again, the kind of stars aligned because the media, and so it's all over the media. And then people like I was, I was current at that time. And then I launched a parent release and I sold over a hundred of them. And then the light bulbs went off and that was it. I was like, I don't need any galleries anymore. I don't even need to necessarily, if I play my cards right, do mural gigs that I don't want to do. I right. could solely build a world. Yes, you can think of that as a brand. I like to think of it as a world. You can build a world around what you're doing. And that changed everything for me. And then I got really deep into the nitty gritty, building an email list you know, and really cultivating a sort of a gallery in your space and um, everything that entails. And there'll be some good print releases, some, some are not that good. My last one wasn't great. So it's not like everything is great right now. Right. Um, and then one last final, final detail is also, you know, I, I also created an online course that was huge, mm -hmm. an online course. And I, under, and, I, and I learned Facebook and Instagram advertising, like it went that deep because I have a family and I want to do this full time. And so um, and I want to do the projects I want to do. And so then I was like, okay, I could potentially just have my course and just paint pieces of nature and survive fine. And so that's a very long answer. I'm so sorry. No, but, no, that's, I think, uh, you know what, David, what's, in, what's important and you, and you mentioned it, it's real talk. And that's why we do this program is we want our students to get it from the horse's mouth. Like we want them to hear it's not always peaches and cream. It's not always sunrises every day. You hustle, you work, you struggle at times, but you have to keep getting back up off the mat. You got to keep trying it out. If it's something you really want to do, it's there for you, but it's not an overnight success. And mm -hmm. we know that for a fact with, with the 20 plus something artists that we've talked to over the, these two seasons, not one person has been a quote unquote overnight success that it takes time, it takes effort, it's about hustling, it's about hard work, it's about putting in the time, it's that 10,000 hour rule that they always talk about, that you don't become a master at something and then you put in the 10,000 hours, mm -hmm. like every yeah. artist that we have talked to on this program has done multiple 10,000 hours, <laughs> like it's, it's insane the amount of work and it's, it's funny because we only really know you through what we see on your social media. So mm -hmm. there are some artists like I can, MK, I'm thinking back to Vic Lee, our very first artist was like, he makes it look like he's working 24 seven, but sometimes if you're not taking, if you're not keeping track, he'll repost like something five or six times over like six months. And it looks like he's got this incredible body of work that he's constantly working. I was like, no, it's not like that. Like right now I have nothing going on, but that's the reality of it. And I think that that's such an important thing for our kids to understand is that it's an ebb and a flow that it, when it's good, it's fantastic. When it's not good, you better get your ass up off the canvas and get up and keep going yeah. because nobody's going to feel sorry for you. Nobody's going to reach out and throw you a bone. Nobody's going to say, oh, you're a struggling artist. I'm so sorry. Let me pay for your rent for the next six months. Like it doesn't, it doesn't happen that way. Yeah. So, the, uh, the years of living in someone's barn for a painting are long gone. Um, and like, that's something that was drilled into me in, university by one of my professors who I still keep in contact with and still go and like talk to his first year painting classes like I I graduated university 10 years ago and I'm still not where I want to be I'm going to keep pushing until I get there um and it's like what David said it's like building that that world that you can exist in as an artist and continue doing what you love and um like I I could never at this point transition and do something else. Like it's, this is, this is who I am and what I'm doing for the rest of my life uh, for better or for worse. <laughs> right. um, but I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't see a, a world where I, I'm not doing this. Right. Art um, is your ride or die. Yeah, basically. Like that's like, if we're going to put it, we're going to put it in, in real terms. That's, that's how it is. I mean, you're, you're going to be doing this whether, you know, it's going to make you into 
somebody really, really well known and famous or not. Like that's just, it's ingrained in your blood. And I think that's another thing that's important for our kids who identify with that because we deal with so many kids who are looking to find themselves and don't have an identity yet and need that connection to something and feel like in our classrooms, it's a safe place to investigate that and find that and then Mm -hmm. say, you know what? I'm glad that I watched episode 30 because Jessa said something that held true to me or David said something that I connected with or Alex made total sense when I heard him say that. And that's why we're doing what we're doing is to give our kids, you know, to, to sound schmaltzy about it, like inspiration, yes, but we also want and appreciate that real world experience and that real world talk that, hey, listen, this is a job but it's also a passion. Like the difference, Mm -hmm. I tell my kids all the time, you can have one of two things. You can have a job or you can have a career. Make the choice. A career is something where you don't feel like you've worked a day in your life. If it's something that you truly love and you truly are enjoying when you're doing it, if you just happen to make money off of it, holy cow, you can't get better than that, you know? Mm -hmm. Or you could clock in, be miserable for nine hours a day, clock out, go home, get drunk on the couch, pass out and do it all over again and feel miserable. Like those are your choices. Like the the options are there. You don't have to not do something that you really, really love to do. There's a, there's an avenue for it. So um, just to, to, to end off because we are well over an hour at K, which is what we expected. Although well under the 15 hours that Alex predicted (laughs) we would be on together, but um all three of you now following you are continually pushing your work into a new avenue. So what I want to finalize with, with all of you is where do you see your work going? Do you have things planned? Where do you see yourself evolving? And is this environmental topic still going to be a a major part of what you're doing? Alex, I'll start with you because I know you've been now working with what looks like reclaimed woods and, and objects that you're finding and you're putting, I love the new, the new phase you're, you're taking on. What's going on with that? And where do you see it going? Uh, it's, it's just another branch of what I do in the forest, really. Like I'm, um, like there's other, there, there are other things that I'm, I'm working on that are larger and different. I think I've mentioned one of them to David over the past few months uh, that I, I won't really get into because I'm still thinking of the logistics of how to do it. Um, but it's it's more just at this point for me, it's figuring out how to do what I'm doing better and bigger. Um, and the, I mean, the, the reclaimed wood thing is something that I've always enjoyed working with. Like I, I do, I, I've always enjoyed woodworking and I've always enjoyed building things and making things. So for that, it's just another way to blend everything that I enjoy doing into one. Um, But at that same point, it's kind of like that business mind of being an artist comes in is those pieces are very marketable. Um, And at that same point, it's still reusing and getting waste out of the world and doing things that I want to be doing. Um, but just doing it in a way that can possibly allow me to do this for longer. <laughs> right, right. Sustainability in, in both a figurative and literal sense. Yeah. 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 I could see that. Just so how about you? Where do you think you're, you're headed with your work? Is there, is there a, an avenue you've been eyeing or what's going on um, with, with where you're at? Yeah. So the last, I mean, I've only been full-time artist for four or five years, so it's still very much uh, developing over time. I'm working on a solo show right now, which I haven't had in a few years. So that feels really exciting. And I have a couple mural projects that are coming up. So it's, it's really just still trying to hone in what, um, yeah, where I like what Alex was saying, just trying to get better at what you're doing and push the envelope. And I think for me, what keeps me engaged in this career in this purpose is that I'm curious so I'm curious in what I can do with the mark making I'm curious in who I can interact with and where I can go with it kind of especially 
like echoed in what David is doing. Like you step outside, you get outside of the gallery. I'm so far outside the gallery that now I'm trying to get back into it. (laughs) 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 But I think like what I hear so often from, and what I kind of felt and talked about is like in the outdoor industry, people are like, I don't know how to look at artwork. I'm not an artsy person. And I, it's so disheartening because it's, it's actually, we all, your art is whatever you want to make of it. And I think that bringing the outdoors back into the gallery space is going to be the next process for me. It's like so many people in the art galleries is like, I do urban hikes and I go, I don't know, walk in the center of the park and like, I'm not outdoorsy. I don't climb mountains. It's like, well, what does it feel like though? How do we still tell that story and make people connect mm. with these places so that we do protect them? I think it's really challenging for us to get behind things we don't understand. And for people who haven't stood on top of peaks, they might not have that feeling. So maybe artwork is a way to evoke that sense of, wow, these places are special and worth protecting. Right. So right. A bit of like a roundabout way of saying like, I'm just still playing and <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Where which, is, which is all good though, because I think, I think like we said, it's, it's the journey more so than the destination. If the journey is the right path, if you stay on that path and you, you know, have an idea of where you're going and at least follow the direction that your heart is telling you to follow that the destination is where you should end up. And it's, it's, it's more appreciated, appreciated when it happens organically. I think when you force the journey, I think that's where the frustrations come in. That's where the disheartening comes in. That's where you want to give up and you want to, you know, you want to kind of say, well, it was this the right choice to begin with. Dave, what, what about you? Are we expecting to see like, Go into like a uh, crevasse in like a Finnish ocean somewhere and, and drop down something crazy. Like, what are we doing? I mean, that's that's exactly right. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, in a sense, in a, I mean, we don't have time, but I, I would love Jess to connect with you. And I mean, one of the key things that I'm all about now is how do I like the adventure aspect, going into the unknown, and um, is as much like what excites me as actually paying the piece it, it's and so how to actually I'm capturing that right now I'm making these short films um but more than anything how do I actually better sort of share that and uh share that excitement with um with the viewer and so for me personally I'm just really really interested in the medium of of I mean just filmmaking and um uh because that's the way you know to document that journey and I don't know exactly how but I'd, I'd, I'd love to release, I mean, I'm, it's potentially in the works of sort of like a short documentary about, um, about just getting out there and painting and, and like Jess has said, just like having fun. A bit selfish in the sense that like when, when, when artists just follow their past and their dreams, I mean, in, in my case, it's like, I'm just, I just love getting out there on the water and just, just painting out there and talking to the birds. I mean, it's just like listening <laughs> to music and painting. I mean, it's just like, if I can do that, I'm going to be really happy. But of course, also the desire to push the envelope. I mean, I guess Jessica, just like like you would totally get that in regards to the analogy to snowboarding, where you're just like you're trying to push your limits. You're just trying to. I did for in high school a short period of time uh, men's gymnastics, where it was like you know flips and stuff like that. And this there was always some new trick, some new move you wanted to try. And there is that sensation with the work I'm doing now. And so um, you know when you look at some gorgeous places around the world, it's like how do I feasibly get there? and try a piece there and document that and document the, you know, it fading away. And so there's just so much room to, 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 to I mean, to do things. And more than anything, I just want to do it more consistently because at this point in time, I'm only like doing around two, two of these larger pieces a year since I started this. I mean, it's like nothing. I, I would love to do it like every two months. So more than anything, I just want to do it more consistent and uh, spend more time outside. I'd, I'd say, yeah. Yeah. I think listening and talking to the three of you is just it's a revelation in a time like this when everything has been so shut down and closed off and connections have been cut and connections with the environment and being outside and being with each other has been cut and hopefully now seeing everything starting to slowly at least stateside things are slowly starting to open up a little bit i'm hoping that we can get back to that kind of thing. But I think it's important for our kids to understand that the messages that you send, it's not necessarily being selfish. I think it's necessary. I think it's self-serving. There's a difference between being selfish and being reflective with yourself by yourself. I think that that's more of what 
what the three of you do as artists, it's not so much selfishness. It's about reconnecting and re-energizing yourself. And I think it's a, an important part of each one of your DNAs that it's in you, that it's something you have to do. It's a calling. And I think that it's important that you keep feeding that calling because it's not hurting anybody what you're doing. And I think that that's a beautiful thing. I think that's the most important thing to take away from this. MK, do you have any, you've been very quiet this episode, bro. I don't it's think I've said one, th- I haven't said one thing, but I've been no. listening and I'm, I'm switching, shocked. working and on the camera. it's not ca- like we will work in the room a lot. No, 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 no. I'm switching, switching back the camera views back and forth as people speak and getting gathering my images and stuff well like throw that. some throw some final shots in now I mean, no what, what it's just thinking? it was just great to hear everybody's point of view on everything you know and and see the comparisons and the differences between your your work it was great yeah i think it, it's certainly worthy of a milestone 30th episode for sure uh, i think it's one of the the more cooler things that we've had the opportunity to do you are three very very talented very very uh outgoing and fantastic people to talk to i have thoroughly enjoyed dming with all of you and and messaging you and and getting to know each one of you i think it's been a fantastic thing and alex thanks for helping us set this this whole connection up i i hope to uh, to see some collaborations maybe down the line with 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 the three of you i think that would be kind of cool to do i know logistically it might be impossible but it would be pretty cool to see like a like a trifecta kind of thing happen. I think that would be awesome. <laughs> and uh, and we're still waiting to see who can get to the East Coast first, so we can have a drink and hang out and get to know you <laughs> a little bit better. And I know we want to get Alex up on the High Line and hide a piece on the High Line somewhere in Manhattan. <laughs> kind of cool. Uh, I think that would be pretty awesome. But uh, thank you so much for the, the, taking the time out to three. I know it's been a little bit logistically. Uh, difficult with the different time zones but we finally made it work and, and we appreciate you guys being so uh so outgoing and, and open about what we should do so uh, hopefully this is going to be seen by a lot of people and we got three completely different yet similar approaches so hopefully you'll connect with somebody who's watching and one of our kids will be like wow yeah that's exactly what i want to do so, uh, it has been quite a ride mk this was a great one my friend i had a blast it was all worth it for sure So thanks again, and thank you, everybody, who's going to be listening in. Uh, That's a wrap. We'll see you on the other side. Peace out.